This is Andy Purrell for Boxing Social in association with Betfred, and I'm delighted to be joined by Matt Macklin over Zoom. Matt, first and foremost, as always, how are you doing? I'm fine, Andy. Looking forward to the boxing this weekend. It's good to hear. Um, there's another big show coming this weekend, but before we come on to it, let's just go pa back to this past weekend and Billy Joe Saunders' victory over Martin Murray. Comfortable throughout, but what did you make of it, Matt? Yeah, pretty much what we expected. You know, um, Billy Joe, too, too young, too fresh, too sharp, too quick, too mobile. Murray, the good, solid, tough old pro he is, was always going to tough it out. I never foreseen him being stopped uh, because even though Billy Joe had moments where I think he, you know, he definitely buzzed him. I think Martin's just too tough, too proud and too experienced and knows how to survive those moments. Um, so it was pretty much what I expected. Um, like I said, Murray's had a fantastic career, should have been a world champion, but you know, timing, timing is, is key, isn't it? And he just, he had, he never, he never got the rubber degree green on the nights that he should have. And, at this roll of the dice with Billy Joe, timing, you know, he, his timing just didn't suit, you know, his timing, his time had been, you know what I mean, where it's Billy Joe's time now. Um, I think what, have, what we'd like to see now from Billy Joe is that he builds on this, you know, he got 12 good rounds under his belt. Um, you know, he needs to get back out soon, soon as, you know, not waiting another year before he boxes, loses that momentum and then he has to start again. I think I'd really, I'd like to hear now that he's boxing end of February, March, sometime around then, you know, in, in some kind of a, a big fight. You know, or, or, or maybe that maybe that's unrealistic, but maybe, say, maybe, some, you know, the winner of uh, Cal the winner of Canelo and Callum Smith, that would be nice. Maybe that wouldn't happen in March, but, you know, the winner of that would be, be nice to see Billy Joe fight. They're the big fights he needs, I think. With his performance, he was relatively comfortable from watching it. Was there any kind of surprises that maybe he didn't put his foot on the gas a little, maybe look to get the stoppage? No, because I think I think I think he did it. I think he did see if it was there. But you know, like you've got to credit Murray. He's, he's experienced. He knows how to survive those moments, and he's tough as well. And he it, it was going to be hard to stop him. You know, so I think Billy Joe knew there was no point. Going for it if it's not there, you know, if it's not if you go for it, if it's not there and you go for it, you can waste an awful lot of energy that you end up paying the price for. So and I, I never I don't think he ever really felt it was on the cards. Like I said, there was a couple of times when he, he troubled Murray and I think he did put shots together and see was it there, but then he quickly realised it wasn't, so he, he eased back off and you know, he knew it was a twelve round fight, so he boxed accordingly. Moving forwards and onto the rest of the card, Matt, we saw James Tennyson with devastating first round knockout victory against Joshua Royley. What can James take from that? I mean, if we're being brutally honest, a Royley looked like someone who was completely out of his depth. He he had a good record and he was, he was a nice boxer, but he hadn't boxed. You know, he wasn't very seasoned. It was a he was undefeated, but he hadn't really been in there with anyone of any note. So he, he wasn't, yeah, he wasn't seasoned uh, as as opposed to James Tennyson, who's fought for a world title. He's had a few losses. He's regrouped. He's reinvented himself. He's gone up in weight. You know, this is a guy who now is probably, I think he's twenty seven years old. He, he's probably at his peak, or certainly coming into the peak now. Like I say, he's he's learned lessons. He's had his setbacks and he's come again. So now he's probably, these next few years are probably going to be the years of his career. So, yeah, you know, Joshua Riley really was just out of his depth, you know. Uh, but I do, what I will say about Tennyson is I think he's, uh, you know, you, you get guys who have stoppages on their records and then you get guys who have knockouts on their records. When they hit you, 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 you when he hit their opponent, you can see that they're very heavy-handed, that they've got genuine knockout power, one-punch knockout power. And I think James Tennyson's one of those guys. He's uh, very heavy-handed and, uh, and he knows he's got that power as well, so he can afford to be patient. One of your Sky colleagues and former Cruiserweight champion, Johnny Nelson, uh, said that he thinks he'd back James Tennyson to <laughs> defeat Javonta Davies. Um, what are your thoughts on those comments, Matt? Well, that emoji... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um 
No, um, I, I, listen, I think Javante Davis might be the best lightweight in the world. I, I, I mean, I think you've got L- Lopez, Lomachenko, because, you know, Lomachenko's still right up there. Lopez beat him, but he's still Lomachenko on another day, you know. Who knows? So, I think you've got Lomachenko, Lopez, and I think Javante Davis. Even, even I'd even put above Devin Haney. You know, don't get me wrong, Devin Haney's got lots of talent, and he may well be up there as well. But he, I think... I don't think he's as proven as the others yet. You know, Leo Santa Cruz, what he did to Pedraza at that time. I mean, and, 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 you know, Leo Santa Cruz, uh, that's what he's done to uh, Leo Santa Cruz, that knockout. You know, he he's established himself right at the top of the bunch, as has Lopez with the win over Lomachenko. You know, and Lomachenko's, like I said, didn't win against Lopez, but he's, you know, he's still up there. Um, then you've got guys like Luke Campbell, you know what I mean? Who, who, who are, a lot more proven. You got so, and he's fine. Ryan Garcia. So Devin Haney's definitely gonna have a fantastic career, and he may well establish himself to be the very best of the bunch, maybe. But he, but he hasn't. I don't think he can say that yet on who he's he's beaten. Where you know Santa Cruz, you know he's he's proven, isn't he? To to to, to uh, so uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think Johnny got carried away in the moment there. Listen, Denison can bang, don't get me wrong, so he's got to punch his chance with anyone. But, no, I think he's... Uh... Listen, you can get excited sometimes <laughs> when you're watching a fight. I think Johnny got excited. Um, Matt, moving on again. Shannon Courts now returned with a, a very good performance and a stoppage victory. But what did you make of her win and what must have felt like a pressured fight for herself? Yeah, listen, you, you, your first fight back after a loss, it's nerve-wracking because, you know, how, how are you going to be? What, you know, you, you think you, you've, had, you've just spent the last however many weeks on once analysing your loss, where you went wrong, your preparation, everything about it. And then you you, you either make adjustments, yeah, you make adjustments, you, you try and make them, make sure you don't make those mistakes again and you want to improve and you want to perform well and you want everyone talking about you again. Um, and she... She definitely felt that because, I mean, I only seen a couple of the interviews beforehand, but she was very nervous. You know, she, she put a lot of pressure on herself. Um, that said, she performed really well, I thought, uh, and she got the icing on the cake with a lovely uh, one-punch KO, that right hand, lead right hand, stepped into it lovely, bang on the chin. So I'd say she's, uh, I'd say she's absolutely over the moon. We saw Lorraine Richards make his matchroom debut as well against Timo Lane. Timo Lane, not the most engaging of fighters, to say the least. Um, similar question to the Saunders Murray fight. Surprised all that maybe Lerone never put his foot on the gas. But a very different fight and different level of opponent, don't get me wrong, but maybe Lerone could have looked for that stoppage or. Yeah, do you know what it is? It, it, it's difficult. I, well, first of all, I don't, I, that's not, I don't think that's his style. I don't think he's not an aggressive guy. I, I don't think he carries a lot of power. He's a, he's a tall, upright, very orthodox. Even though he's a southpaw, he's very orthodox, technically orthodox. He's, he's uh, correct, you know, well scored, but does everything you're supposed to do. Very textbook. Um, I don't think he's, a lot of his punches are arm punches. I don't think he, he, he's particularly heavy handed. He doesn't carry a lot of power. So I don't think he's going to be someone that you're going to see causing a lot of stoppages or knockouts. That doesn't mean. He can't beat fighters that do that. That is just that's not his style. He's more of a boxer. So, and then you're boxing. He's boxing somebody who's totally in survival mode. Isn't trying to win. Just wants to tuck up and get through the fight. Difficult to look good against guys like that, and difficult to knock guys like that out if they're tough and experienced, and especially if you're not a puncher. So, yeah, look, he, he got eight rounds under his belt, and uh, this is a guy who's been inactive in his career. He hasn't been busy at all. So I think what's key for him now is that he just gets out ASAP and fights again and stays busy, stays active. And, and he, he'll improve and, you know, he'll go into a 50 fight, 50 50 fight at some point. Um, and maybe it'll be against a guy who's an absolute knockout merchant and maybe he'll have boxing. You know, stars make fights. Not everyone has to be, uh, you know, not everyone's a big, big. James Tennyson's the one who carries genuine power. Uh, this other guy didn't. On Saturday night, Matt, we saw Anthony Yard succumb to the second defeat of his career against Lyndon Arthur. What were your thoughts on it, Matt? It was a very, very close fight. Um, from what I saw, a lot of people have had it either close to the draw or edging towards Lyndon to the very least. What were your thoughts? 
Well, I, I turned it on and it was in the fourth round, so I missed the first three and a half. And going by the commentators at that point on the telly, they was they basically were saying that they thought uh, Lyndon Arthur won the first three. So from what I see, it was a close fight. You know, if you throw Lyndon Arthur those first three rounds on top of that, then I would I would agree that the general consensus was that the general consensus seemed to be that it was a fair decision. I know Yard felt that he got beaten. And from what I've seen, it was very close. But if he did lose those first three rounds, then obviously, then, then I probably would think that, that Arthur won it. So, look, it, 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 I think it was definitely a close fight. But I, I, think, I think the general consensus online was that it wasn't a bad decision. It wasn't a robbery. It was just a close fight. Um, like I say, you know, unless you sit there and score all 12 rounds on a 10-point more system, I can't say what, what whether it was the right the right decision. Like I said, it was, but what I've seen, um, it was a close fight. Those, those lat, rounds four to twelve was, was very close, um, and actually Yard finished stronger. You know, he came on strong in the end, uh, but by by all accounts, he, he he threw the first part of the fight away a little bit. That Lyndon Arthur just uh, jabbed him. I had it. Uh, I had it as a draw, maybe edging towards Lyndon. I did give Lyndon the first three rounds um, of the fight. To be fair, as well. But from what you saw, Matt, how much credit does Lyndon deserve from the way that he's able to stick behind his jab all night and to come over win effectively, just using that and to guide him to a victory is some doing. Yeah, well, it, it it takes a lot of discipline to have to have a game plan. To have your tactics agreed with your truck with your trainer and then to stick to it for 12 rounds and not get engaged and dragged into a fight because I think at times Yard was certainly pressing and I think he would have liked it fought at mid range or close quarters where he can you know put his combinations together. But Arthur kind of controlled the distance with the jab and the feints. And every now he didn't throw many right hands. A lot of people were thinking as he broke his hand, I even thought that myself watching it, but then he would throw it every now and then. I think he was wary. You know, Yard likes to walk in with his pre- pressure, with his presence, which makes you throw that right hand. He likes to shoulder roll it and then fire back. So I think he, he must have been caught with that early in the fight, Lyndon Arthur, because he was very reluctant to throw the right hand. He was wary. When he did throw it, it was good. Um, so I think the, the fact that he was still there, you know, Yard had to be careful of it. Couldn't just walk in. Um, but but he controlled the fight and the distance with the jab for, 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 for lots of it. Then other parts, Yard was busier. He worked the bodies, jabs the bodies, straight right hands to the body were good. I thought Yard's body shots were good. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, look, it, 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 like I say, I missed the first few rounds, but going, going from what everyone was saying, he, uh, he controlled the early part of the fight and the jab. And, you know, listen, in a fight like that, Bagging a few early rounds on the jab without exerting too much energy, knowing it's going to be a twelve-round fight, you know, and saving a bit for the, that last bit—that that's crucial. Matt, both fighters and Frank Warren have come out and said there is a rematch clause there. So, depending on what does happen in the rematch, where does it leave the Josh Bawatsi fight for Anthony Yard? A lot of build-up had been spoken about with regards to that taking place next year. How much kind of damage does this defeat do to that fight and to making it? Well, it, it takes the shine off it a little bit, you know, It's um, and it probably holds it back if there is a rematch clause because they're probably going to do it again. I mean, that's not an easy fight to make anyway with the fact that Yards with Frank Warren and fights on BT and Boatsy's with Eddie Hearn and he boxes on Sky. So there's going to be issues there. This is just another hurdle now, isn't it? Um, you know, so... I don't know, maybe it doesn't happen next year. Maybe that fight doesn't happen next year. Boatsy and Yard, or, or maybe, you know, who's to say it won't be Boatsy and Lyndon Arthur now? I, you know, that looks more likely now. He's the one who won, but that very much could go the other way. So, you know, it's all if some buts and maybes. Not, none, of, none of us know. We, I mean, everyone, has, everyone makes plans in boxing, don't they? TV networks make plans, promoters make plans, and managers make plans. But then the fighter and the trainer just have to take you one fight at a time because the reality is, who knows what's going to happen, you know, especially when you're up to 11, you're in championship fights and, you know, they're, 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 not every fight's 50-50, but, you know, they're competitive, 60-40, whatever. They're, they're, you don't perform, the other guy does, you could lose, you know what I mean? So you can't, um, every fight's, once you get to that title level, it's, you know, you you can't be looking past people. It's, um, 
that's not to say you don't dream and you don't make plans, but I think you have to, you know, once once the next fight's on, on, been arranged, the more you can just kind of leave that to your team, your manager and your promoter, and just focus on the job at hand, you know, the, the, the more you're guarding against the danger of complacency creeping in, because that complacency, you know, it's a fucker. You know, it, it creeps in subconsciously, it's hard not to allow it to get in. It just, it just it seeps in very... Uh, very sneaky, that complacency. So the, the more, the more you can set things out so that you're staying as focused as possible, the better. And like I say, the more you can leave stuff like that to you. You know, future fights and moves being made has to be something that has to happen. But I think if you can just let that leave that to your management team and your promoter and let them work the stuff out, you just get in the gym and focus on the guy that's you know in front of you. One other thing before we come on to this coming weekend, Matt, uh, during the night on Saturday, once again, we saw Errol Spence Jr. return to the ring against Danny Garcia. Did you catch the fight? If so, your thoughts? No, I didn't see I didn't see the fight. Very well. We'll move on to this coming weekend. Then, Matt, uh, Anthony Joshua, Kubrat Pulev, AJ returning to defend his titles once again. What are you expecting to see from him in the bout, Matt? Um... I think we'll see a more aggressive Anthony Joshua than we've seen in, in Saudi, which is understandable. You know, he's coming off a knockout defeat and there's a lot on the, on the line. And Ruiz, very fast hands, uh, very good at that mid-distance short hook. So I think he did the right thing tactically, game plan-wise in, in Saudi. I think he just kept it long and tied him up when they got close. And Don't get caught. Don't hook with a hooker. Don't get caught in a mid-range shootout with a guy who's got faster hands than you. So he didn't do it, so I thought he boxed an intelligent fight. I thought he showed a lot of discipline to stick to it for the 12 rounds. Um, but, you know, Pulev's a different fight, style-wise. Um, he can punch. Pulev can. He's a, he's a good fighter. But I think Joshua, I think, he'll, I think he'll start like he always does. I think he'll, he'll look to establish his jab, find his range, get his jab going. And, he, and I think he'll just like let everything flow after that. But I don't think he'll be as... Uh, I, I think if he hurts Pulev, then I think he'll go for it, you know. I don't think he'll be as restricted game plan-wise, tactics-wise for this fight as he was for Ruiz. I think Ruiz, I think Rob, Robbie McCracken had it drummed into his head going into that fight. I don't care about no knockouts. I don't care about no exchanges. I don't care about looking exciting. I just care about winning the fight. Box it long, tie him up when you get close, don't get involved at mid-range. I'm guessing that's what the tactics were, because that's how we boxed. But I don't think it'll be as, you know, as the I don't think tactically it'll be as stringent this time. Is there a pressure on AJ Matt to get back to kind of what we've been used to seeing throughout his career, that more vicious side to him, that knockout artist that we've seen up until you know, the Parker fight when he went to points and obviously the defeat to Ruiz. Is there a pressure on him to get back to that against Pulev ahead of what would hopefully be the Fury fight in 2021 for the undisputed titles? I don't know. Not, not as far as I would think. Not as far as I could see. Well, why? You know, he, he lost one fight, which was catastrophic by the fallout and the aftermath and what everyone was saying. Yeah, he went straight back in to the immediate rematch, even though a lot of people thought That'd be a bad move. He boxed intelligently and very disciplined to get the win in Saudi. And now he's fighting his mandatory challenger. And on the other side of that could be the potentially the biggest fight ever between him and Tyson Fury. Why would you put unnecessary pressure on yourself to look exciting? You know, he's looked exciting. You can't be exciting every single fight. And if you try and look exciting, rather than if you focus more on how you look and rather than winning, then I'll give you this way. So I can only speak from my own personal experience. Anytime I was more focused on looking good, I boxed rubbish. When I was just focused on winning, I boxed brilliant. You know, when I was just, ironically, when I, when I was focusing on how I looked and how I was going to win and I wanted to look exciting or I wanted to look like a, a nice, clean boxer or whatever, I boxed rubbish. I went down levels and I boxed terrible. When I, when I was focusing just on the win, I boxed well. And that's because when I was focusing on the win, I had a genuine uh, level of fear in me, a, no, a good level of fear, that, that level of fear that makes you sharp, 
you know i weren't thinking on how i looked uh how i looked with what, what style of getting the knockout and being aggressive because everyone will be talking about it because then you're worrying about loads of bullshit when you're just focused on winning that means you are giving the person you're fighting the 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 the, the right amount of respect that you all your all you're focused on is getting that win even if that's by one round on a split decision just getting the win then you're giving your opponent his due respect and that'll mean that you're mental preparation, your focus, everything is as it should be, and then you'll perform well. But if you start thinking, I want to look aggressive, I need to do this guy quicker than such and such a one, now you're not giving this guy the due respect. Now you're now you're not wet. Now your focus and your mental preparation isn't where it should be. You'll come down the levels and you won't box well. If you just focus on getting the win, that that to me tells you, this is a tough fight here. I don't care how I win, as long as I win, chances are you'll box well. Just want to work through the card matter moving forwards. Huey Fury versus Marius Wack. On paper, I think most would expect that to go the distance. What are you expecting there? Probably. I mean, he's a tough guy, isn't he? Back and experienced. And Fury's not overly aggressive. You know, he's not, he's, well, he's not aggressive. He's, he's more of a boxer. Um, not, and, you know, I've never seen him to be particularly heavy handed with one shot. He's more of someone that outboxes you, outmoves you, outmaneuvers you, outboxes you. So, no, I think, uh, I don't think that'll be a knockout. I think you few beats on points. Macaulay Kuzman, it's an interesting <laughs> matchup in itself again. Um, your thoughts on it? Yeah, man, I, I, it, good, good, good fight. It is a good fight. Kuzman's good, but, but I like Macaulay. He's very relaxed. He doesn't load up. He just put, puts them shots out there, just keeps keeps you off balance. And uh, it's a good fight. Prob- yeah, I think, uh, I think Macaulay will win. Now, unfortunately, obviously, we've seen a few fights fall from this card, Matt. Um, one, well, one other world title fight, which would have been between Lawrence Okoli and Christoph Blavatsky, for, um, falling off it due to Christoph um, testing positive for COVID. Frustrated or gutted for Lawrence, Matt? Yeah, disappointed for him, you know what I mean? He was world title shot and the coach, you know, chief support to Joshua. Uh, just before Christmas, you know, to really set him up for a big next year. But he'll it, it, have a great next year anyway. You know, that fight will come. It, you know, he, he, um, he st- I'm sure he's, I think he's still got, he's definitely still going to box. They're going to find him a new opponent. So, you know, at least he, at least he fights. Um, and then, you know, he's on the cusp of that world title shot anyway. So, it, you know, it's a, it, look, it is a setback. It is disappointing, of course it is, but he just has to get past it now and focus on the, on the, uh, the new opponent. You've got Kez Ashfak returning um, after his last defeat um, oh. as Mark Leach. Again, similar situation to what Shannon Courtney was this past weekend. Pressure. How important is it that kind of he doesn't allow the situation to get to his head? And what do you think of the fight with Ashlane? Uh, I haven't seen enough of Ashlane. I can't give a, a you know a massive opinion on that. But I think Ashfak will just need to. Do the same as uh, as Shannon Courtney, just uh, as anyone does when they're coming off a loss. You know, have to put it behind you. You've got to learn, take what you can from it, what lessons you needed to have learned. You've worked on them in the gym, um, and go out there and and, and perform and, and and hopefully get the win. And then and then you, you, your career's moving in a, a positive direction again. You know, look, Mark Leach boxed absolutely brilliant that night. Um, and that's taking nothing away from Ashback. Obviously, they that was a fight he, he thought he was going to win, but they'd they'd trained together, they'd sparred together. You know, that can be misleading sometimes. You know, uh, look, he, he, he's he'll want to come back with a win, and I'm sure he'll be totally focused. I don't think he'll he'll he, he looked there's pressure to a degree, but you know, there's there's pressure every fight you have in your life. You know, you never want to lose. So, look, he'll he'll, he'll be fine. I'm sure. Just get your thoughts on a couple of other things, Matt, before I let you leave to enjoy the rest of your day. Um, a fight which I know you'll be very excited for, Floyd Mayweather versus Logan Paul. Seems to be officially announced for next year. Just kind of your thoughts on it once again. What's that emoji where it goes like that? Here's what it is. What else can you say? What do you make of the YouTube crossover, Matt? We've obviously seen a number of YouTube fights up to now. How far do you think the kind of this trend will go? 
I suppose as long as it keeps making money. You know, not, let none of them are boxers, are they? But if they can do something, if they can create a gimmick, or, or, you know, or, or an event, if they can create an event out, out of nothing, then, and they make money, they're going to keep doing it, aren't they? I think, I think uh, until someone gets badly knocked out, maybe, you know, maybe then that might, that might uh, slow things down. And final thing, Matt, obviously next weekend we see Canelo versus Callum Smith. Just as a preview, what are you expecting from it, Matt? And how do you rate Callum's chances in there with Sal Canelo Alvarez? Listen, Canelo's the number one superstar in boxing. He's, uh, he's at the top of his game. But, you know, there's, there's probably a couple of people that you give a real chance to beating him. And one of them is Callum Smith. You know, he's a, he's a massive super middleweight. He can box and he can fight on the inside. Like for someone that's so tall, he can really fight on the inside. He's dangerous at mid-range. That catch and count the left hook he throws, that's like his, you know, honey punch. That very dangerous, that so quick with it. Um, you know, and he carries real power. Got great variety, great jabs. So he's, he's a top, top fighter. Uh, this will, this is this is a dangerous fight for Canelo. This is a this is going to be close. Whatever happens, I think this fight's going to be a close fight. He's got the you know he's a Canelo's Canelo. You know he's got that speed and he's just an unbelievable fighter. But you know there are weight divisions for a reason. I know he beat Sergei Kovalev, but I think Kovalev was shot, and um, you know he beat Rocky Fielding. But you know Callum, Callum Smith did Rocky Fielding and around so. You know, I, th I, th I think this is this is one of the most dangerous fights uh, Canelo's ever had. I saw an interview a couple of weeks ago where Eddie said that there is no rehydration clause. How key or how big of a difference do you think that will make for Callum? Well, do you know what? I don't think Canelo takes a lot out in water and, and Callum, all fighters do, you know. But I, I don't think Callum takes as much out as people think. There's, there's, I know there's a lot of people that take a lot more. Do you know what I mean? I, I think Canelo will probably be taking about the same out in water because that's the way he does things where, you know, I don't know the exact details of these, by the way. This is just an opinion, but I know when I was, I know it's a few years back now, but, you know, Callum didn't really, even though he was massive as a super middleweight, he didn't overly struggle. You know, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't actually too bad. So, um the rehydration clause. I just think, look, both guys are going to rehydrate up to wherever their optimum weight is. You know, it'll depend on how much water they take out. That's what that's what it'll be. Um, but it's good that there's no restrictions and all that because that's just, you know, I think that's rubbish. You know, you're either, you're a box at weight or you don't. You don't want a box at the weight. You're trying to make stipulations and control things and put conditions in, which you know, down through the years, the, the marquee fighters have done. But I think that it's a little bit of a let me shut that wing. Matt, we'll leave that there now. I'll leave you to enjoy the rest of your day and the coming week. Um, I appreciate your time as always. And thank you for speaking to Boxing Social. Thank you.